the fundamental document of the United Nations is what is called the United Nations Charter. Okay? You must remember that. United Nations Charter is the fundamental document which was signed in San Francisco on October 24th, 1945. At that time, there were only 51 members of the Security Council, oh sorry, of the General Assembly and um, India was one of the signatories even though India had yet not become an independent country. Because we became only independent only in 1947, but it was already decided that India would be independent. On that basis, India signed the UN Charter as an original founder member of the United Nations General Assembly. So since then, from 51 to 193, the General Assembly has expanded. Okay. And when in 1945, the Security Council had only 11 members, five permanent members and six non-permanent members. So the idea was that if you have 51 members, you must have 11 members in the Security Council. So, and then later in 1965, the number was increased to 10 plus 5 to 15. So the only expansion that has taken place in the history of the United Nations or the Security Council membership is from increasing the membership of the Council from 11 to 15. And when it became 15, at that time the membership of the UN was something like 80, 80. So when you had 51 members in the General Assembly, you had 11. When it was 80, it became 15. So there is a proportion between the members of the General Assembly and the members of the Security Council. And if you maintain that proportion, now that there are 193 members, Security Council must at least have 30 members, 30 or 40 members, strictly speaking, if you keep the proportion. 11 for 51, 15 for 80, and then 193, how much it is, you can calculate. It's a huge number, okay? So, on the first occasion, when expansion was called for, everybody agreed. They realized that 11 is too small a number. And therefore, non-permanent membership was expanded, 6 to 10. So from five permanent members and six non-permanent members, it became five permanent members and ten non-permanent members. And at that time, the permanent members said, this far and no further, no further expansion. Whether the General Assembly is 193 or 200, we will keep it at 15. This is what they decided. But the demand for expansion of the Security Council started in 1979, when India proposed, and remember very carefully, expansion of the non-permanent category only. So we proposed an expansion of the Security Council, non-permanent category from 10 to 15. We proposed that in 1979. Okay, so the story goes back all the way to 1979. And at that time, the proposal was only to increase the non-permanent members. Okay, very clear. But this was opposed by the permanent members very strongly. And they were very angry with India for making this proposal in 1979. And they made representations to Mrs. Gandhi saying that this was a major disruptive measure by India. And of course, many other, other countries joined India and uh, an item was inscribed on the agenda of the Security Council of the General Assembly in 1979 called Expansion of the Security Council. This happened in 1979 and since then, this debate has been going on. So how many years now? More, more than 40 years and nothing has happened so far. Why it has not happened? Because to change anything in the security, in the charter, you need two-thirds majority of the General Assembly 
and support of all the five permanent members. Okay? And this is not something you can achieve. So even if one permanent member does not agree, you cannot expand the Security Council. All right? And also, from the General Assembly, you need two-thirds majority. That's something like 140 member states have to support. So, 140 states from the General Assembly and five permanent members, they have to agree to change even a word in the UN Charter. Okay? And that is why even some important things which have happened, nobody has changed it in the Charter, but just paid it, put it into practice without changing anything in the Charter. And one example is, if you read the UN Charter, when you look at the title, Permanent Members of the Security Council, it still says, Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics, a country such like that doesn't agree, exist on this earth. Okay? Nobody has bothered to change that into Russian Federation. That's what they did in actual fact. One evening they pulled out the flag of the Soviet Union and put up the flag of Russia without consulting anybody because this was an understanding among the permanent members. When Soviet Union collapsed, automatically they changed to Russia but did not change it in the charter because then you need two-thirds majority of the General Assembly and five permanent members. It may have been possible, but still it was not done because it could have created some complications. Somebody may have said, why Russia? Why not other republics of the Soviet Union? So therefore, to avoid that, in practice, Russia took over, but the charter still says, so Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics. So strictly speaking, you can go into the, in the General Assembly and challenge this. Where is the Soviet Union? Why are you saying this? Why don't you change the charter? But people don't do all that because there is an understanding generally that Russia is the successor to the Soviet Union. So why I mentioned it? Because such a minor change but important change is not able to make in the, security, in the charter because of the complications of changing the charter. Another strange thing about the charter is there is a clause called the enemy clause in the charter, okay? It is known as the enemy clause. What does it say? It says that those countries which lost the Second World War, and who are those? Very major countries of the world today, Japan, Germany, Italy. They say these people are the enemies of the United Nations, it says. And therefore, they do not get any of the protection that the charter gives to other member states. How, what a peculiar thing. So, in other words, though the countries are not mentioned, but they have said that those who lost the Second World War, they have declared them persona non grata. These people have no protection from the Charter. And this has not been changed till today. But Germany and Japan are the second and third biggest contributors of the UN, very important in, globally, but that is not reflected. But Everybody knows that nobody will use this clause. So, literally, if you declare war against Japan tomorrow, the UN cannot object because Japan is an enemy country. But even Japan doesn't raise this issue because they know very well that such a thing will not happen. So, why I am saying is, so, changing anything in the charter is very sacrosanct. And after 1965, Nobody has touched the subject of expansion of the Security Council. So there is no intention on the part of the permanent members to change this, this situation. Then after the, after the end of the Cold War, in 79, we asked for five extra non-permanent members. But at the end of the Cold War, people started saying that some of the countries which were developing countries before have become so important that we should also add five more permanent members to the Security Council. Of course, the permanent members were against expansion if non-permanent membership, <laughs> but they were even more against permanent members, more permanent members. But why? Because permanent members means automatically veto. 
They said, we will not give up the veto, but we will not give the veto to anybody else. So, now the proposal before the security council, before the general assembly is that we expand the security council membership from 15 to 25. This is the demand. Why, how? By ten, five permanent members and five non-permanent members. Which means there will be 10 permanent members and 15 non-permanent members. This is what the developing countries want. Okay, is it clear? Any doubts? So, the demand of the mostly the developing countries or generally the demand is there should be expansion number one and what is that expansion should be? It should be 25. Okay. So, there are so many proposals starting from no change to 25. In between, there are all kinds of figures. Some people say, okay, only three permanent members, three non-permanent members, so let us make it 20. Some people say 21, some people say 23, 24, all kinds of numbers are being floated about. But all these proposals, none of them enjoys the majority, two-thirds majority of the General Assembly and five permanent members. There are hundreds of proposals, but no proposal enjoys the support that you need to change the charter. This is the situation. Okay. So, what has happened between? Four countries joined together, India, Brazil, Japan and Germany. And they wanted somebody from Africa, so from Asia, Japan and India, from Latin America, Brazil and from Europe, Germany four countries and one country from Africa, either Egypt or South Africa or Nigeria, one of the three. So, the idea was that these five countries are campaigning to become permanent members. And since Africa is not represented, it is only called the group of four, it is called G4. So, if you are asked what is the G4 in the UN, it means India, Brazil, Germany and Japan, who consider themselves fit to be permanent members. Nobody else is telling you that. Okay? They say we are the largest, all those arguments I will come to later. But these four permanent, me four members of the UN are considered to be the prime candidates. But there is no chance of any one of them getting it unless there is an overall agreement which everybody subscribes to. So, my theory is that no expansion will take place in a hurry. Government of India propagates this. Oh, we are likely to get it tomorrow, day after tomorrow, etc. Mr. Modi keeps saying it is our right. Earlier we used to say we are eligible. Now, Mr. Modi says we have the right to be permanent. Well, he can change his words, but nobody else is listening to them. So, why are you applauding that? There are some anti-Modi people here. Isn't it? <laughs> But what he is saying is good for India, so do not applaud. <laughs> so, these four countries have been negotiating with others every year to try to find some formula. Then at one time, the permanent members discussing these possibilities, they said, you may get anything, but one thing we are sure that you will never get a veto. If you are asking for an additional veto, forget about it. Okay. And then we checked with the others, other supporters of ours. They said, veto you should not have, even they agree. Because people generally, the majority of the countries of the world do not want veto for anybody. So, they think that these five vetoes are bad enough and they do not want another five vetoes. So, even our best friends who think that India should be a permanent member will say, but we do not want more veto. Okay. So, at one, a few years ago, we announced that we will not insist on the veto. Make us permanent members, but we will not ask for the veto immediately, so we will postpone it. In other words, we made a concession. Okay. So, from a position of our wanting to be permanent members with veto, we have scaled down our demand to permanent members without veto. Okay? 
this is good or bad, you can think about. In my view, I think it is bad. If you don't have a veto, and if you sit in the, in the Security Council, you are dealing with the whole world. If you are a member of the Security Council, you have to deal with every country in the world. Even if it is happening in some Timbuktu, you have to take a position. It is okay, you can take positions on anything, provided you are the veto. Because in that process, you will make many enemies. Suppose there is a fight between two countries and we take the side of one of them. So, you create one enemy then and there. Like that, you will have enemies in different parts of the world. If you don't have a veto, if you make so many enemies as a permanent member, when Kashmir comes up against you, they will create trouble for you and you won't be able to veto it. Right? So, in my view, permanent membership without veto is dangerous. But that is not the view of the government of India. Government of India has said we will accept permanent membership without veto. That concession we have made. And the offer from the other side does not extend to that. They say no five countries. They say it is too big already, 15 is too big. So let us add one or two. American position is, so whoever speaks on the basis for, the, for America has to say that this is too big already. So the maximum that we can accept is one or two. They don't say how many and who. Okay. That is one argument that they use. The first let, us, let me give you the arguments for expansion. Why should it be expanded? Question, the point number one is the proportion, as I mentioned. The proportion between the General Assembly and the Security Council has to be maintained. So, there is enough justification that now we have 193 members, we can have 25. This is our argument. So, 11 when the, when the General Assembly was only 50, 15 when General Assembly was 80, and now that we are 193, we can easily have 25. That is our argument number one. Number two, the world has changed since 1945. Today's world is not the world of 1945. What is the peculiarity of the world in 1945? There were the winners of the war. And they are the ones who made the United Nations. The allies, that is, the permanent veto-wielding countries, except China. China was also part of the alliance. So, these were the five countries who won the war. And they gave to themselves permanent membership and veto. Nobody challenged it. And when any country joined the charter and signed the charter, they accepted the superiority of these five countries. 